Yes, can you hear me now? Yep, good. Okay, good. Can you see my full screen? Yep. And okay. So uh, let me get started. Uh, welcome. My name is uh, Rinko Gupta. I am a research software specialist from Argonne National Lab. And today I will be talking about uh, agile methodologies. This is approximately a 30 minute talk. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat window. I can see the chat window, but my colleagues will take a jump start at answering some of the questions. So let's, let's go to the next slide. So what do we talk today? Today we will first talk about agile methods, especially in the context of small teams. I'll talk about what agile is, what is the terminology that is frequently used, what are the approaches we follow, and some basic methods to uh, you know get started with. So look, let's look at small teams first. So we've all worked work, work with small teams, right, at some time or the other. And small teams, as the name says, are small. They, if in an academic environment, uh, there might usually be, you know, one senior faculty member. In a research environment, there might be a PI, a personal investigator who leads the team. And there may be several junior members uh, who may be postdocs or other, other students, depending on the environment. The roles of the senior and the junior staff in such teams, they vary very, very significantly. A senior staff uh, member provides stable presence. They may be uh, around in the team for a long duration of time, uh, sometimes for their entire career. And they can usually see the, the forest from the, from the tree, from the, what they call the trees. The junior staff may be there for a shorter period of time perhaps until they complete their uh, education. They may come, they may go more frequently. The senior staff are the one who many times provide the overall vision and understand the broad goals uh, very well, but they very infrequently have the time to sit and write code. The, actually, the actual code writing is done by the junior staff who, who are the ones who sit and hack the systems and who know all the lower level details. So large teams have a lot of interaction challenges and uh, uh, the challenges faced by large teams and small teams, they, they, are, they are quite different. So what are, the, what are the small team challenges? Usually, as I mentioned, small teams have an informal structure and less clearly defined processes in, processes in place. And anyways, uh, the workflow processes that exist for large teams and enterprise environments, they are you know, probably too heavyweight and they are generally not necessary for small teams. In addition to all this, there are other challenges that small teams face. There's usually a constant influx of people and you have to ensure that all the people who come in or the new people, they can ramp, ramp up quickly so that they are able to uh, contribute quickly. And, and that when they are done and they're ready to exit the team, uh, the challenge then becomes, how do you retain all the information that they have garnered? Because you know, they are the ones writing the code, they understand the system well, how do you ensure that uh, the knowledge can be retained so that somebody else can take over? So there are uh, several challenges that small teams face. So this is, this is a nice chart which shows a research team members uh, a life cycle. And uh, so how does it start with? You have an initiation setup phase out, out here. I don't think you can see my cursor maybe. Uh, but uh, in the initiation, there's some initial startup phase. Uh, that's, that's when the person joins the team. And then there is a, a ramp up phase where the team member starts ramping up. The ramp up time usually depends on how effective the ramp up process is, how much experience the new team member has, and it can vary considerably. The next phase is when they're actively working, which is what you see in the ongoing work section of the chart. And when they're actively working, they are contributing, they are writing code. And when they are ready to exit, there should always, always be a ramp down path. And usually when it's a student or a postdoc, one has, when, one has a good idea, right? When they are graduating uh, and there's opportunity to train a replacement member and to capture the contributions. 
And once they exit and a new member joins in, this research team member life cycle is repeated. So how do you deal with all this ambiguity and uncertainty that comes with these challenges? One way to deal uh, with this challenge is to have checklists and policies in place. What are checklists? Checklists are essentially to-do lists. And on this slide on the right-hand side, you see an example of a new developer who's joining the team, a new developer checklist from the Trillino Scientific Project. And it's basically an onboarding checklist. It basically says what the new team member is supposed to do to get started. What kind of uh, having a checklist, first of all, is very good because you're essentially documenting the process. And if you're missing something in the process, then you can simply go ahead, improve the checklist, and then automatically your process gets improved. What kind of checklist you want is totally dependent on you and your team. You can have um, onboarding checklist. You can have offboarding checklist. You can also have checklists for code development. You can have checklists for code reviews, testing, so on and so forth. So that's checklist. And another one, one other way I want to mention for ensuring consistency uh, and maintaining consistency is to have policies. And policies are essentially rules. And out here, if you see at the very bottom, there is a link uh, to the XSDK project, which has uh, community policies. And that those policies ensure that not only consistency within one project, but across the entire area of math library projects. So definitely checklists and policies have a uh, good value add uh, in your team. So let's talk about Agile a bit, bit right? Uh, why, and let's talk about Agile. Let's see why it works for small teams, especially in the scientific domain. In the scientific domain, you really don't know when you're going to have a breakthrough. And when you have a breakthrough, your work pattern drastically changes. For example, you have a big breakthrough and you decide that, hey, this needs to be published. Then you stop perhaps working on code actively and then you start working on a paper, sometimes start working on a proposal. So the work pattern drastically changes if you have a breakthrough. So having heavyweight techniques and approaches, uh, they are not really conducive um, for the scientific environment. Now uh, with Agile, if you are a small team, uh, which many scientific teams are, uh, you can pick and choose as to what kind of processes you really want to adopt. What is meaningful? What is improving your productivity, sustainability? What is improving communication in your team? So instead of adopting um, a wide array of processes that are perhaps not very beneficial to you, you can actually choose what you, what you want. So I'm talking about Agile. Let's talk, about, uh, let us talk a bit about what Agile actually is and what it is not. So let's, let's discuss what it is not because sometimes there's some confusion about it. Agile is not a software development life cycle. It's not like your waterfall model or an iterative model. It doesn't have different phases that a conventional software development life cycle has. Most of the cycles, uh, you know, most of the traditional software development life cycles have one phase strictly followed by another phase. So that's not uh, what Agile is. And many times uh, I've noticed that people don't do very good work. They do sloppy work, sometimes a little bit of implementation, sometimes a bit of testing, don't complete anything. And then they say that, hey, I'm following the Agile method. So I Agile is again, not an excuse for doing sloppy work. And that is something again, that's not um, uh, acceptable. Uh, sometimes people don't write documentation or formal requirements and again, say this is agile. So that, that's definitely what it is not. And because, uh, and let's talk a bit about Scrum, right? A lot of people, maybe all of you, some of you use Scrum. Uh, so Scrum is a framework that helps team work together. And uh, there are people who consider agile is synonymous with Scrum. So Scrum is definitely Agile, but Agile is not just Scrum. There are ag other Agile methods that exist and Scrum is just one of them. And speaking of, uh, of Scrum, now that we are on the topic, Scrum is a very good framework for people uh, that use it, but uh, its applicability in scientific team is not been explored much. Uh, people definitely prefer something that I'll discuss called Kanban a lot more. So let's discuss what uh, Agile is. And to understand what it is, uh, the best thing to do is go to this website called agilemanifesto.org and read the manifesto. The Agile manifesto has four uh, critical components that you see on top of the red box out here. 
uh, the first component, I, I won't go through all of them, but the first one says that um, individuals and interactions are more important than processes and tools. Another one, the second one says working software is more important than comprehensive documentation. Now, this does not mean, again, as I said, that you can't, this doesn't mean that you can use Agile as an excuse for not writing documentation and say that, hey, the manifesto says working software is more important than documentation. So uh, comprehensive documentation. So that is what it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that. What it's saying is that the items on the, uh, we value the items on the left more than the items on the right. And that's the red box that is highlighted. So comprehensive documentation is important, but working software is more important. You know, uh, following a plan is important, but responding to change is more important. So if you're serious about Agile, it's a good idea to look at the Agile manifesto, uh, the four main components and the 12 principles it has. So I think the next, next two slides uh, show uh, the 12 principles and we don't have time to go through all the principles, but I'll touch maybe one or two. The first principle says that a highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And uh, this principle is important because this is what Agile actually focuses on. When you are implementing software, uh, the, the software has to be given to stakeholders uh, early and as frequently as needed. This is because if you look at the older software development lifecycle processes, uh, they, they would need a lot of time investment for designing, for implementing, for testing the software. And eventually the process was so long that by the time the software was ready, a lot of time has gone by and requirements have changed and the target environment has changed. And there's a lot of force fitting that goes on to get the software uh, still working or make it more, still make it valuable for newer platforms or newer environments. So Agile tries to circumvent this by saying that, have the software out to the customer as early as you can, as frequently as you can. The second Agile manifesto is also very important. It says that we welcome changing requirements, even late in development. So that means Agile supports changing requirements but it doesn't mean that a, a stakeholder or a customer can walk in and say, hey, uh, change my requirements today. And again, come back after a week and say, change my requirements again. It doesn't work like that, but it's important to know that Agile does offer way to change requirements. And again, it goes back to the first point where, you know, as time passes during code development and implementation requirements change, and there needs to be a good way of getting some of these things early on into the code. So if you're interested, take a look at uh, both the slides carefully. A lot of items on the slides are highlighted in red, such as sustainable development out here, or the theme reflecting on how to become more effective at, at the very end. These are all excellent, excellent principles and worth reading if you are uh, serious about Agile. So when you're getting started with Agile, uh, one thing to remember is that these 12 principles that I just spoke about, they are not hard and fast rules. The basic philosophy of Agile is that instead of following one rigid framework that is ill-fitting and that if followed for a long enough period of time may ultimately uh, lead to frustration and failure. Uh, instead of that, it's better and good to investigate, uh, to, uh, it's, it's, be it's, it's better for all of us to look into agile practices and adopt them if suitable. That's the, that's the philosophy. And one way to do this in real life is we pick up a practice, we sit with our team, we see what works for our uh, team, what resonates with them, we try out the practice, and if it doesn't work, we move on. Now, one thing I want to mention again is uh, Kanban, which is a great starting framework because it's used by a lot of scientific teams and hence, we do think um, Kanban might be beneficial for a lot of you. So you can, even with Kanban, you can start with following the basic principles of Kanban, which we will discuss in a later slide. And then you add better practices whenever you think you need better practices. Following something like Kanban is perhaps uh, more advantageous uh, than, for, uh, than following something like Scrum, which, which sometimes may be force-fitting for scientific environments, but you know, uh, uh, so, some teams use it, um, but Kanban definitely has more value. 
I think the next slide out here is, it's, it's a very easy slide and uh, very important because it shows what a basic Kanban board looks like. So when I think of Kanban uh, in very, very easy terms, layman terms, I think of it as a very nice, elegant, sophisticated to-do list. If all the tasks in my head right now for my project were translated to a board, it would, it would look pretty much like what you see on the, in the table out here with four columns. Every scientific uh, project essentially has tasks that can be segregated into columns. And uh, some of them are listed out here. You will always have a backlog of things to do. You will always have items that are ready to be done. You would have items that uh, are in progress and you would have a done column, which is like um, a list of columns that you um, that you've accomplished. And you can have such as, uh, you can have many other columns, right? Uh, uh, in, you can have uh, waiting for vendor, or you could have items in review and so on and so forth. You can be as creative as you like with your columns. Uh, what you see out here in, in the slide is just a snapshot. And you know, many times we've seen students being very creative about columns and having columns saying, you know, waiting on uh, confirmation from advisor and so on. So it is um, up to you as to how you want to design your Kanban board. Uh, when it comes to Kanban principle, kan Kanban uh, to actually implement Kanban properly and make it very useful, you uh, should follow some basic principle that, that is just a recommendation. Uh, one example of one of the principles is that you limit the number of tasks in the in progress column. That means you limit the tasks that you're actively working on uh, so that you can, uh, you know, drive those tasks to completion before starting new tasks. Uh, uh, now, in progress tasks are specific to each team, right? But the general recommendation is that you have uh, not more than two n minus one tasks, where n is the number of team members. Now, having some of these principles is good because uh, you know, otherwise, if you have too many tasks in in progress, you're going to spend a lot of time context switching and may not really make progress. So how do you optimize flexibility versus context switching overhead? How do you ensure that the team members are like not overcommitted? Uh, things of this sort become easier to address when you have uh, rules assigned to your in-progress column. Uh, one beauty of Kanban board is that it's very good at exposing bottlenecks, especially when it comes to team productivity. For example, if you have a column named blocked where you're waiting for feedback from external collaborators and if that column is full, then you know where your bottleneck is. The bottleneck is basically not getting timely input from your collaborators. And once the bottleneck is identified, you can figure out how to resolve it. Therefore, you can say that it's very effective, Kanban is very effective in a R&D setting because it avoids uh, the deadline-based approach as compared to many tools such as Scrum. And it's a very nice, elegant way of viewing task managing, managing tasks. This is a slide on personal, personal Kanban. And uh, it shows that Kanban is, simply, is just not there simply for your work life. You can very much apply it to your personal life. In fact, I use it uh, to manage aspects of my personal life every day. There's a book uh, referenced out here, Personal Kanban, which is one of my favorites. Also, I want to reference, uh, there's a link at the bottom, which re refers to bssw.io. And bssw.io is a website. It stands for Better Scientific Software. It has a lot of articles on how to, uh, on software sustainability, team productivity, how do you improve your own productivity, Kanban and so on. So Kanban tool. So now that you know the theory behind Kanban, how do you actually go and you know, start practicing right now? Uh, the Kanban board is basically, as I said, a set of columns put together. And uh, how do you basically, what, what kind of tools you can use to implement this? You can use your wall if you want to get started right now. And uh, I, I remember the first time I used Kanban, it was used, I was using the wall along with post-it notes, you know, stuck one below the other in different columns. You can use whiteboards and blackboards. These are all basic approaches if you want to get started right now. Uh, but in addition to all this, there are there's a lot of tools available for Kanban and uh, a lot of work environments use Jira. GitHub uh, has a provision for creating GitHub issues and project boards, which are like simple Kanban boards. In my personal life, I use something called as Trello. Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O. Trello is basically a free software available for Android, iPhone, iPad. 
and I use that uh, to man manage tasks in my life and with my family. So there are definitely a lot of tools out there. So the big question is how many tasks do you have on your Kanban board? And there's no real, real right or wrong answer for this. I think when I started Kanban a few years ago, I used to have like maybe like five tasks to begin with. And it, you know, I didn't need much of Kanban, but now in, in, uh, in, in work life, in, you know, in, in personal life, we, I have sometimes as many as like 20 tasks. And the freeway analogy is a very good example, uh, uh, which, which will ask you the question, does the traffic flow really fast and best when there are a lot of tasks? And the answer is no, right? If you have uh, too many cars on the freeway, the traffic is not going to flow fast and best. So the same thing is true for your effectiveness. If you have a bowl full of tasks, it doesn't mean that you're going to be more productive. And that, that, that's something to keep in mind when you're adding tasks to your bowl. One thing is uh, to keep in mind also is that sometimes when you uh, understand Kanban, you get started with it with a lot of enthusiasm, but really for success, you need to make a habit out of it. The board will bring into focus how well your team is prog progressing, what your bottlenecks are, how much free time your team is having. It will enable retrospection and reflection and definitely Im improve your productivity if you use it sensibly and regularly. And if you, even if you stop it for some time, if you forget, if you, if you drop out the you know drop out of habit of using it, get bored or lazy, then that it's fine. You can just start back again when you have a chance, and go back in in uh, you know go back and start using it and restart the habit. Now uh, in our audience, we have many students. We have young professionals who are just starting their careers, and you may wonder, is Kanban useful for me? Uh, yes, it definitely is. If you have your own Kanban board, you can very clearly see what items are in progress and what items are on the back burner. Let's say you're a PhD student and you're working on many, many tasks. Uh, and then your professor comes and say, hey, we have uh, uh, this new proposal that got funded. Now I want you to add this important task to your list. Now, if you have a Kanban board, uh, you know, and not just a to-do list, your Kanban board can show you that hey, these are the tasks that you are actively working on. And you can go to your prof professor and say that, hey, these are, look, I'm working on this right now. This is what is there in my backlog. This is what is re getting ready. So you can basically negotiate and try to figure out uh, what, what tasks your, uh, you, should, you should focus on. And uh, it helps you demonstrate how much bandwidth you have in terms of time in doing them. So, um, now that we've discussed basic Kanban, uh, let's talk about how we can build upon it. There are several things that you can do to build upon Kanban. Uh, in, in, in a team environment, the focus should always be on solving issue. One way, one way to start creating great Kanban boards is to have a regular 15 minute stand up meetings where people uh, quickly report on their progress in the different columns of the Kanban board. Uh, of course, you can have uh, planning meetings to figure out, you know, um, what's what's going to go in your different columns. You can have retrospective meetings to figure out how well you've done, what things you can uh, improve on, and, uh, and 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 then there are de basically the point is that there are many different ways in which you can build your Kanban board. One thing I want to point out is the concept of epic story and task, and see where that fits in the Kanban board, because that is something that is used very much in all environments, whether research or enterprise. So epic story task, the idea of epic story and task is that when you are working on a project, uh, uh, you start first with only defining the high level requirements of the project in the start. And you start breaking that higher level requirements into smaller and smaller, finer grain tasks only when you need to, and, and if you need to. The reason is that a lot of time can be spent in refining requirements. And many times it happens that you started the high level epic uh, and, you, and you define the tasks, but later on when the time actually comes to implement those tinier tasks, your requirements have changed. So the rec recommendation is that uh, if you need to refine your requirements, do them closer to the starting date so that you don't waste time. Among epic story and tasks that you see, epics are high level objectives, very high level objectives. 
If you want to refine epics to a slight degree, you go to stories. And so an epic has a couple of stories under it. And then uh, a story has a done criteria. It's basically when you conclude a story, you have to say, this is the completion criteria. And the criteria is understandable by the user. It provides, provides a lot of value add to the customer. And the story itself can be broken down into finer grain tasks. Uh, you can think of tasks as a set of steps needed to complete a story. Uh, the, in terms of hierarchy, epics have multiple stories and each story may have multiple tasks. That's what you need to remember. And once the stories are marked done, your epic is uh, considered complete. Here's a quick slide uh, on um, what the stories are. The stories are many times called user stories. And user stories are something that are very easy for your customer to understand and for your team to understand. And the format of the user story is usually it says, as a customer or as a stakeholder, I want to do this so that this can be accomplished. And below out here uh, is a heat example. It's just a heat equation for, you know, think of it as just a code for measure, measuring heat. We will discuss it a little more in the session later today. But the user story for this example is, as a developer, I want to modularize the heat equation utilities so that I can make easy use of those utilities for different projects. So and another example is that as a developer, I want to be able to use uh, uh, the different integration functions easily so that I can figure out which function is best suited for me. So uh, these, these such kind of user stories are very relatable, relatable to both the customer as well as developers. This loud slide out here, uh, yeah, this slide out here will uh, again shows uh, what is the high level epic. The epic for uh, these user story is, these two user stories is uh, more higher level, which, which says, which will say that uh, you are, uh, you want to refine or refactor the code for increased and enhanced modularity. So the point, to, point of this is to show that epics are higher level. And then uh, as you develop user stories, it becomes more and more clearer and the tasks are steps to user stories. A very good example out here uh, of a Kanban board from the collegeville.org school website. This example is put here so that you can explore it and see how Kanban boards can be designed and you know, how they're actually used. You can get inspired from it. This is basically actually a GitHub board and GitHub is free for you to create accounts. And uh, you know, I think uh, uh, it's, it's a very useful tool. Now, Kanban and GitHub, a lot of users out here use GitHub. And one thing to mention is that GitHub uh, does provide support for basic Kanban boards. It doesn't have a host of features, but the advantage of Kanban boards are very simple. The learning curve is very small. And therefore, if, uh, using the boards that uh, GitHub uh, uh, provides is actually a, a good starting point for many teams. If you are uh, especially a team that is already using GitHub for code development, then uh, Kanban boards are worth exploring. These boards are uh, called project boards in GitHub, if I remember correctly. Out here, the slide shows uh, uh, an important tool uh, that we have, in, a set of important tools that we have in place so that you can actually understand practices and see how it applies to your team. The URL will take you to the information, you know, uh, to a site where all the information and resources are uh, are, are stored. Again, the better scientific software website uh, is uh, bssw.io is another good resource to get all these kinds of information. And this is my last slide uh, where I want to focus on some of the other resources that are available should you feel inclined to go and read on this on your own. And uh, there's a lot of information on the web too, but I personally like some of these books out here, Code Complete, Agile Samurai, More Effective Agile, and so on. So this is a final slide uh, and I wish you luck on your Agile journey and I'll be happy to take questions.